Despite the challenges NASA now faces following the Columbia disaster, the space program will continue. Our next guest knows something about overcoming obstacles. In 1983, he became the first African American to fly in space. We'll talk with him about his career and about the future of space exploration. Let's take note with Dr. Guy Bluford, who flew four shuttle missions and logged nearly 700 hours in space. Today, he is president of the Aerospace Technology Group, headquartered in Cleveland, Ohio. Thanks so much for joining us. It's good to be here. You spent 15 years with NASA as one of its elite astronauts. I'm wondering if you can tell us where you were and what went through your mind on February 1st when the Columbia disaster struck. Well, I was at home, and uh, so I heard it on CNN News about 10 o'clock in the morning, and at first I didn't believe it. And then I had thoughts about the Challenger accident, because I remember that, and I was in the astronaut office at the time when that occurred. So a lot of my thoughts went back to uh, thinking about the Challenger accident and what happened there and the aftermath associated with it. And in fact, you flew the last successful nighttime flight in the Challenger right. in 1985 yeah. before uh, it, it blew up or disintegrated right. At, right. At, at liftoff. Right. Right. And also on top of that, I knew uh, at least four of the crew members uh, on that flight because they were my classmates. So I had a close bond with the people that uh, we had lost in Challenger. Did you know any of the astronauts in Columbia? Unfortunately, I didn't. And uh, I had been out of the program since 93, so all the astronauts on, on Columbia were new, so I didn't know any of them. Former uh, astronaut John Glenn, who, like you, was once a fighter pilot, uh, he recently reflected on his own experiences after the Columbia disaster, and he said, yes, it could have been me. D did that thought run through your That mind? thought ran through uh, with me, too, and I couldn't imagine. I remember hearing about what had happened, and I envisioned myself going through that same experience because I had ridden home four times on the shuttle, and I remember how smooth that ride was. So I realized that how it seemingly a very benign uh, entry really was a dangerous entry, and we just never really recognized it. Astronauts know the inherent risks in, in space exploration, and in any exploration for that, for that matter. Is a liftoff and reentry? Is there a, a period where where what ifs start racing through an astronaut's mind? I don't think so. I think uh, when astronauts go out to fly the vehicle, they're very comfortable with uh, flying the vehicle, and they're well prepared to handle any sort of the risks that they anticipate. And so, when you go out to the vehicle, you are anxious to fly it. You want to do it successful. You anticipate that it will be successful, and yet you're well prepared to handle any sort of contingency that you think. Uh, May occur. Now you flew after the Challenger uh, disaster. Right. Did you were, were different thoughts going through your mind when you boarded Discovery? Uh, no. To be truthful with you, I felt even more comfortable because I knew that uh, the changes that NASA had gone through as part of the Challenger accident would make flying the shuttle even safer. So, and I also participated in the post Challenger uh, accident investigation. So I felt even more comfortable when I flew on STS thirty nine. Despite the the, the comments that uh, that uh, Senator former Senator Glenn made. He said he still believes that the benefits of sp uh, space flight are worth the risks. My guess is you feel exactly oh, yeah, the same. Oh, yeah, I, I, I feel exactly the same, and I think we owe it to those who've lost their lives to continue forward. Uh, we are still in the infancy phase with reference to exploring space, and there will be uh, accidents and problems along the way, but I think we owe it to everybody to, to march forward and continue forward. Speaking of continuing, the investigations into what caused the Columbia disaster are ongoing, uh, although they continue to point to the foam insulation as the culprit, although the NASA's top administrator said we will probably never know exactly what happened. Well, I think uh, we're pretty much narrowing it down to the leading edge uh, tile on the left-hand side of the wing. and uh, But what really caused it, we're really not sure. And I would agree with the administrator, we may not really find the root cause of it otherwise. But we had, yet, on the other hand, we're going to have to come up with some sort of change or modification on what we think the cause was. 
John Glenn, I keep going back to him because I, I read some interesting uh, interviews uh, that he did, but he was in New York uh, several years ago, and he was joking about what it was like to, to be in space, and he said, how would you feel on top of two million parts built by the lowest bidder Better. on a government contract? And it made me think, to what extent are the problems that we saw a result, and maybe they aren't at all, uh, to, the, to the emphasis in building the space program better faster, cheaper? Well, uh, better, faster, cheaper, I think, was pushed by the previous administrator, Dan Golden, and his, his uh, effort was pushed in that direction in order to make the agency much more efficient, and I think that there were some good aspects to that. Uh, but yet I think we've gotten a little further away from that because we realize that there are some risks associated with better, faster, cheaper. And, uh, but then I think on the other hand we've gained a great deal with reference to efficiency in trying to do that. Right now, there are three astronauts orbiting in the International Space Station, which relies on the space shuttle system, sure. not only to transport them there and back, but also to transport the necessary equipment. We're about halfway to building the International Space Station. With what's going on, where do you think NASA should go from here? Well, I think NASA is running in the right direction. Uh, the three astronauts on board the International Space Station are safe. They do have a, a Russian vehicle that will bring them home, and the plan is to bring them home the either end of April or the first part of May on the Russian vehicle, and the Russians will provide crews to the International Space Station until we get ready to fly the shuttle again. So I think we do have transportation back and forth on the International Space Station. And right now, NASA needs to find out what the cause of the problem was on Columbia, get it fixed in order to get ready to fly again, and hopefully they'll be able to do that uh, within the next year. The, the International Space Station relies on the scientific and technological resources of 16 nations, including Russia. I'm wondering what impact, if any, you think uh, the U.S.-led preemptive strike against Iraq may have on your continued relationship in space. Well, I hope it doesn't have a negative effect. Uh, I'm pretty sure it has some effect, and, and there has been some discussions with the Russians, particularly with reference to Iraq. Uh, that impact has had a little effect uh, with reference to recovering the astronauts on board the International Space Station and, and bringing some more up. But I think in the end, hopefully, it won't have any effect at all, and, and the group of nations that are running the International Space Station will operate it uh, regardless of what was going on outside of that. What shuttle was going to retrieve the three astronauts now orbiting in the International Space Station? I really don't know. I think it was probably Discovery, but I wasn't sure. It's and at this point, that's grounded. Right. Okay. All, all three of the, the shuttles are grounded until we find out what's, what, what the problem was with, with Columbia. What shape, what's the status of the other shuttles in the fleet in terms of age and, and how well they're holding up? Well, all of them are about 20 years old, except for Endeavour, which was uh, built after the Challenger disaster. So all of them are at least 15 or 20 years old. Uh, one of them is getting ready to go through a major overhaul so and NASA keeps them in pretty good shape so they uh, they rely very heavily on them and all three of them that are left are the ones that are qualified to attach to the International Space Station so they're they're regularly maintained and uh, are well kept there there are conceptual designs for what will one day replace the shuttle system how far off is that is there is there soon to be an alternative to the uh, the fleet of shuttles? I think it's going to be a while. Uh, NASA is looking at a replacement for the shuttle uh, because the shuttle is getting older. The DoD, a Department of Defense, is also looking for a similar sort of vehicle. They're starting to to work together on putting putting something together, and I suspect it'll be another ten years before we really see something uh, that'll actually replace the shuttle. Matter of fact, we're looking at uh, flying the shuttle all the way out to at least 2020. What, what, to your mind, are the benefits of wa working cooperatively as opposed to competitively in space? I think space has gotten so expensive now that we do have to work cooperatively, and uh, that has proven to be a good thing. And then also the International Space Station is forcing us all to work uh, together. And it's very interesting to go down to the astronaut office and see astronauts from around the world, from Japanese and Canadians and Americans and cosmonauts all working together on this one goal, which is to fly the shuttle and to build the International Space Station. Speaking of goals, 
What is the ultimate goal? Is, is it to explore Mars? What, what do you see as the ultimate goal of all of this? I, I think the ultimate goal is to step out beyond our Earth's atmosphere, our Earth planet environment and go beyond. It could be Mars, it could be beyond that. I think humans are explorers and uh, we will always continue to expand out beyond the, uh, the universe as much as we can. What do you say, Dr. Blueford, to the critics, and they seem to come out of the woodwork in, in the form of op-ed pieces that I, that I read in almost every publication uh, following the Columbia disaster, uh, saying things like space exploration is too costly in terms of uh, human life, economic terms. How do you respond to that? No, I totally disagree with them. They're all, there will always be risk uh, for explorers, you know, and uh, if you're going to continue to make progress, you're going to always have some risk associated with it, but the benefits associated with uh, learning more about the universe, learning more about Earth, about flying in space are well worth the risk associated with it. Now, you are known above all as the first African American to fly in space. What does that achievement mean to you? I'm very proud to be part of that, but I think uh, I'm proud of just be part of the astronaut program. I came in in 78 with two other African Americans, Fred Gray, Gregory and Ron McNair, and I think we were all trailblazers with reference to African Americans flying in space. And I hope that our role, my role model, their role models were sufficient to encourage more African Americans to join the space program. Now, John Glenn, I, I believe he was in his 70s when he went, went back in, into space uh, some years back, and he's proud to say even at, at 81 or 2 uh, that he could still pass the physical fitness test. Would you, if given an opportunity today, would you return to space? I think I would. I think I would. It's a, a great uh, adventure, a great opportunity. I could understand what, how, I can, re I realize how much John Glenn enjoyed his experience, particularly since he was trapped in this little bitty capsule on the first time he flew. So the advances that we've, we've made ever since and his opportunity to fly in shuttle, uh, I'm pretty sure he enjoyed very much. With just a couple of seconds remaining, you, you, you mentioned that the accommodations are a lot better right. today than they were before. Uh, what is it like? Is it a cla claustrophobic atmosphere in, no, in a shuttle? No, it's not a claustrophobic atmosphere. It really is a, um, a very comfortable atmosphere. And surprisingly enough, people think, uh, that you're closed in, but yet you have a lot of space because all the space, the space above your head, you use. So you really have a lot more space. And But the view out the window is spectacular, and uh, the zero G is enjoyable, so it really is just a thrill. Is that view of you you will never forget? Oh, yeah. I, I would agree with that. And I still remember there are views that I remember looking out the window that really stood out for me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. I've been talking with Dr. Guy Bluford, who was the first African American to fly in space. For Take Note, I'm Patty Satalia. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.